We are in the book of Revelation. We completed the first half of chapter 12 last week, and today we're gonna cover uh, the rest of chapter 12. And as I was writing the message this week and thinking through the theme of this message, I was reminded of the, the, the stories of conquerors, because history is full of stories of conquerors and the land that they conquered, right? I mean, for instance, Napoleon Bonaparte, he conquered 720,000 square miles. I wrote some of these down. Adolf Hitler conquered 1.3 million miles, but he obviously gave it all up in three years, right? Lost it. And Attila the Hun conquered almost 1.5 million miles. Alexander the Great, 2.2 million miles almost. And Genghis Khan, almost 5 million miles. And today, uh, as, as we look at, at, at this, I think one of the greatest images of conquering that I, at least I think of when I think of conquering is the image of the American soldiers raising the flag at the highest and most strategic crest on Mount Suribachi in Iwo Jima. And you've seen this, and it, it is the most reproduced photo in history because it's such an amazing image of conquering. And the reason I'm talking about conquering is because that's really what the theme of this message is all about. You see, Jesus is the greatest conqueror the world has ever known. He didn't just conquer uh, a few hundred or a thousand or a few million or even a few billion square miles. He conquered every millimeter of existence. And so today we're going to talk about conquering through Christ, right? And so, you know, chapter 12 of Revelation, I think, is one of those foundational chapters. It's sort of like Genesis 1, 2, and 3. If you don't understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3, then you're going to be confused about what's going on in the world. But if you understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you're going to have a better grasp on everything that's going on in the world and all the problems in the world. And it's the same with Revelation 12. Revelation 12, along with Genesis 1, 2, and 3, is one of these foundational passages that lets us know what's going on in the world. That's why it's so amazing. John pulls the curtains back, and he lets us know why there's struggle. He lets us know why there's social and civil unrest. He lets us know why people die and people get sick, and he lets us know why things never seem to go right in your life and why you struggle at work and why you struggle with finances and why marriages struggle and kids rebel. He lets us know why all of it happens, and when he glists back the curtains and shows us this, this war that's taking place, and it's not a physical war. It's not a physical battle. As Paul says, it's not a battle against flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against our, our battle, folks, is taking place. Uh, we, we're confused about who we're fighting as Christians, and I don't want us to be confused. We're not fighting. Our battle's not against politics or politicians. Our, our battle is not against uh, liberal college professors or your spouse. Your battle is not against white supremacists or critical race theory. Uh, your, our battle is a spiritual battle. It's a battle between the devil and his minions and God's people. That's the battle. That's why all the trouble exists in our world. It's this battle. And although the battle's taking place, here's what Revelation tells us. God's already won, all right? That's the theme of Revelation. If you want to boil Revelation down to a theme, it's God has already won. But although God has conquered, and although the devil has been conquered, he is still trying to inflict pain. He's like a snake. You know, where I'm from, I've killed, chopped the heads off a lot of snakes. I hate snakes, right? But I chopped the heads off a lot of snakes, and if you chop the head off a snake, uh, man, it, 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 you know, it still slithers around, right? I mean, and if it's a poisonous snake, you have to bury the head, because if you bury the head, if you don't bury the head, man, it can still inflict some venom and cause pain in people, right? And so, so but that's what the enemy is. He's, he's been conquered, but he's like a snake with his head cut off. He's still slithering around trying to cause pain and inflict pain and he, he knows he only has a short amount of time so he's trying to burn the house down and take as many people with him as he possibly can and he takes the battle because he's been conquered by, by Jesus, he takes the battle now to the woman and we learned in the first part of Revelation 12 that the woman is the people of God. It's, it's, in the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. And John presents this organic union between uh, Israel and the church, right? The church is grafted in. We didn't replace Israel. We are the true Israel. We, we, we're grafted in. And so it's the people of God. He takes the battle to the people of God. But here's what we know as well. We know that God protects his people in this 
battle. At the end of chapter 12, we're gonna read today that although the enemy takes the battle to the woman, God gives the woman two wings of the eagle and carries her into the wilderness where she's nourished and protected. Now, what in the world is all this eagle, the two wings of eagle? Well, the futurist, uh, people who have a futurist view of Revelation, like Hal Lindsey, you know, who wrote the great late planet Earth, he, he says that, uh, I mean, and it sort of, you know, it makes me smile when I even say it, but he says that these two wings of the eagle mean that at some point in the future, uh, God's gonna uh, protect his people through some kind of an airlift, right? There's gonna be this airlift where God's people are protected, and since the eagle is the national bird of the United States of America, it could be the sixth, Mediterranean, sixth fleet in the Mediterranean of the United States Navy. And I'm like, what? I mean, that, that sounds pretty cool to write in a book, I guess, but that's not what this is referring to. Remember, Scripture interprets Scripture, and, and Revelation is a really goes back to the Old Testament, specifically Old Testament prophecy, but when God says he redeems or saves his people, the woman, with the two wings of the eagle in to the wilderness, he's referring back to uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy as the people are exiting is Egypt, that he, he, he carries them away on wings of an eagle. He's talking about God's protection, all right? And so let's dive in. I wanna, I wanna read this chapter, the rest of this chapter, uh, verses uh, seven through 17. And as we do, remember, it is revelation. It's apocalyptic literature. It is packed full of image upon image upon image. If you try to lead it, read it literally, uh, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll really confuse you, all right? And so just remember, it, it, it's, it's uh, apocalyptic. And so now war arose in heaven. Get your attention, doesn't it? Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Remember the dragon from last week is the devil, okay? And the dragon and his angels fought back but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. The, uh, the ancient serpent takes you back to Genesis 3. That ancient serpent that, that tempted Adam and Eve, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, uh, the deceiver of the whole world. Serpent, devil, Satan, deceiver. He's given you all these titles, letting you know who, 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 who's really fighting this battle. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, important word, man, we're gonna dive into this word today. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. That verse is very important because it lets you know what this war is about and thrown down is about, remember that. And this is the verse 11 that we're gonna zone in on today. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, the people of God, who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagles, what we talked about a moment ago, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half a time. There it is again. 1,260 months, three and a half years, time, time, half a times is symbolic of the church age, I believe. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a, with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious and with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Wow, what a passage. I mean, you've got all these images. You've got this war in heaven. You've got uh, the enemy, you know, this two wings of, of an eagle, the woman flying away on two wings of an eagle, the dragon pouring water out of his mouth, the earth opening, swallowing the water. I mean, it, it, it is like just revelation, right? It's amazing, but if you try to read it literally, it will confuse you, right? And so we're gonna focus today on verse 11, and that's gonna be the, the place we really drill down into because it tells us three ways that the enemy has been conquered in this war. 
Three ways the enemy's been conquered in this war, and they're vital and important, and if you get these, it can literally change your entire mindset. I I believe if you get these, you can walk out of here a little lighter in in, in step lighter today, and you can absolutely just see some guilt and some, uh, you know, some, some things that, baggage that you're carrying just fade away, all right, if you get this. How's he been conquered? First, he's been conquered by the blood of the lamb. He didn't say he's been conquered by your efforts. It's very important. He didn't say he's been conquered by anything you've done. He's been conquered by the blood of the lamb. Now notice, here's what John says. He says that there's this battle in heaven. There was a battle in heaven between Michael and his angels and the devil and his minions. Now what is this all about? Futurists, those who have a futurist view, like Hal Lindsey that I mentioned a moment ago, or Tim LaHaye, they they basically uh, think that this is referring to this battle that will take place sometime in the future future immediately before Christ returns to rapture his church and and launch the seven-year tribulation. But I don't think that's what it is, all right? I think this battle started the moment that Jesus ascended back to heaven. Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, came back from the dead, ascended to heaven. At that moment is when I believe that this battle took place. Now, Daniel chapter 12, Daniel refers to Michael, and remember, Revelation is basically a, and a commentary on Old Testament prophecy. Let's go back and see what the scripture says. In Daniel 12, Daniel says Michael is, refers to Michael as the chief angel who throws the devil out of heaven and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and protects God's people during the tribulation. So that, it goes back to Daniel. And what does he mean when he says he throws the devil out of heaven? Well, I don't believe that's necessarily referring to a the geographical, if you will, location that let's say the devil he he you know he rented an apartment on Gold Street in heaven, and Michael was given uh, the 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 task of going and evicting the devil from heaven. I, I don't believe that's it. The devil was evicted from heaven before God created the world. We know back from Isaiah. All right. So what is he talking about? Okay, I believe he's talking about that when Jesus ascended back to heaven after he died and uh, paid the price for the the sin of all. Who who would believe, come back from the dead. The resurrection was the receipt saying it was, it was validated, it was done. Then he goes back to heaven. At that point, that means that the devil and his uh, minions no longer have access before God to accuse God's people. That's what I believe it means. Now, here, here's what we know. He says that the devil is a liar, the deceiver of the whole world. The devil, devil means a uh, uh, liar, right? Satan means adversary, is is what he's talking here. He's the liar, the deceiver, the accuser. And we know that Satan lies. That's his ploy. That's his tactic. He fights the woman. He knows he's been conquered by Jesus, and so he fights the woman, God's people, you and me. And how does he do that? With lies. With lies. That's why John talks about in verse 15, he says that he pours water out of his mouth in an attempt to drown the woman in the flood, but the earth came to her aid, opened up and and swallowed the water to protect the woman. What does that mean? Was that an image of like spewing, rather than a dragon spewing fire, you know, he's spewing water in the earth. What is this? Was talking about the false teaching that the devil tries to use in the battle to confuse you and me. He tries to confuse, that's why it pours forth from his mouth. It's false teaching. The earth swallow, opening up and swallowing the water it goes back to the, the book of Numbers when the, there was these false teachers in the time of Moses and God literally opened up the earth and it swallowed these false teachers. So he's referring back to the Old Testament to talk about this false teaching that the enemy uses to try to confuse the church. He's used it since the beginning of the church. I mean, if we go back to the beginning of the church, you have Gnosticism and uh, Arianism and Pelagianism and Roman Catholicism and liberalism and legalism and man, all those things we could go into. But he got all these isms that he's tried to use throughout history to confuse the church, to to knock you off center, to get you to debate uh, trivial stuff, to get you to debate stuff that's crazy rather than to focus on Jesus and to confuse you. Because if he can confuse you, it's hard to fight when you're confused, right? And so he wants to confuse through false teaching, and he still does this. We still see the enemy tries to fight the woman and attack God's people with false teaching. One of the most toxic false teachings that I think we've had in the last several, a few centuries, a few decades at least, is the health and wealth gospel. 
because it causes people to focus on things and not Jesus. Because you see, we're told that if you have enough faith, then God will heal you. God will heal you. And listen, here's what I do know. I know that God can heal anyone because God is God and he can do anything. And I know that God still heals people, right? But here's what I know. I know that sometimes God chooses not to heal people. And to put on people, if you have enough faith, is a false teaching because sometimes God chooses not to heal people. And that's not about your faith. That's about God's choice, okay? That's about God's sovereignty, And so sometimes in this false teaching, we're told that if you will just sow a seed, if you'll give money, then man, I mean, God will bless you. If you've only got $100 and you're experiencing trouble, just sow that seed, man. I mean, throw that seed out there, give $100, give me your last $100, we'll send you a prayer cloth, and every morning when you get up, man, you'll just wring that thing out and money will fall. Right, you want a Cadillac? Give me give me 100 bucks and man, God will give you a Cadillac because he owes you. See, what this does is, and you think, well, it's, it's crazy. Some of you laugh. Some people, I mean, people who follow the Lord believe this stuff because they're desperate. But what it gets us to do, why it's so toxic, is it gets us to focus on stuff, not Jesus. The things God can give us, not God himself. And, and it confuses, and when, and when it doesn't happen, then we begin to be confused about who God is because we bought this false teaching. There's false teaching about uh, religion, you know, I mean, what you do determines how much God loves you. And so therefore, man, people feel great. and People uh, always evaluate themselves off of other people. People feel really horrible when they don't do great. It's the false teaching. It's toxic. It confuses you, causes you to question God. Man, there's false teaching that says love is love. I mean, love is love, right? Love is love. It doesn't matter if it's love between a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man. It, love is love. It's this false teaching that confuses you and knocks you off course get you out of the battle, right? And so he confuses you with false teaching. That's these lies. But not only does he confuse you, he wants to accuse you, okay? He wants to accuse you. That's what, that's exactly uh, what he did, remember, with Job. You see, the enemy was kicked out of heaven. We read in Isaiah, pre-creation, right? That's why when God created a perfect world, he slithers in, he's there. He's kicked out of heaven pre-creation back in Isaiah. But what does it mean he's in heaven? Well, he obviously had access, although he didn't live in heaven, he's kicked out of heaven, he had access to go before God because he goes before God to accuse God's people. Remember Job, he goes before God to accuse Job Oh, Job's just following you, you know, because of this. He, he accuses Job. He accuses God's people. That's what it says. He accuses the saints of God. We read that. He's the great accuser. He accuses you to God. That, that's, that's what he does, right? And, and, and that's what he did to Job. And, and, his, and, and pre-atonement, before Jesus died on the cross, I mean, guess what? His accusations had some legal weight. He could point to David's adultery with Bathsheba and say, oh, uh, God, look at your servant David. He was a man after your own heart, and he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He murdered Bathsheba's husband. He could look at Samson and all his many shortcomings. He could look at Moses and Noah and Ruth and all of the Old Testament saints, and he could accuse them before God, and his accusation had legal weight because their sin had not yet been atoned for, okay? But after Jesus' death, he lived a perfect life, died on the cross. What was the price for sin? The price for sin was death, After Jesus died on the cross, come back from the grave, and then ascended to heaven, now where is Jesus? Now he is at the right hand of the Father. He is our advocate. Now the enemy, at that moment, that's why I said I think the battle took place where he was kicked out, meaning that he literally no longer can go before God to accuse you, those who believe, for anything, because Jesus is your advocate. Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father, so if, the, if, if Satan, the devil, were to come before God to accuse you, and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, who, whose blood has covered your sin, the blood that we sang about today, then uh, as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, he would come to accuse you, and Jesus would say, shut up, enemy, he's mine, I bought her with my blood, there is no con- condemnation for those who are in Christ, get out of here. That, my friends, is what I think he's talking about. He's, he can't accuse you any longer. That ought to set you free. That ought to absolutely set you free. He cannot accuse you any longer. His, his accusations carry no weight. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. So that doesn't mean, though, listen, he can't accuse you to God 
but he still throws around accusations. He's just changed who he accuses. Now he accuses God to you. Do you think about that? See, that's a ploy. That's, that's, that's part of this fight. He accuses God to you. That's what he did in the garden, wasn't it? Adam and Eve, I mean, what do you mean God told you not to eat of that tree in the middle of the garden? He's trying to hold out on you. He doesn't love you. He's not a good God. He's trying to fool you. He just doesn't want you to be like him. Oh, he, he's selfish God. He, he's, a, he's, a, he, he, he's, he's a God. He's a fuddy-duddy God. He wants to take your fun. He accused God to Adam and Eve, and it can so confuse them. He accused him. He so confused them. What they do? They took the, the bait. So many people today believe the enemy's accusations against God, right? You shouldn't have sex until you're married and then not with anyone outside of your marriage. That's God's standard of sexuality. That's God's standard. Oh, are you kidding me? Man, you're a man, you're a woman, you have hormones, their hormones are right. It's a need God created. And if you don't have sex with him, you're going to lose him. God's just trying to hold out on you. He wants you to be single all your life. If you don't do that, because everybody, he'll go find it somewhere else. And let me tell you something, you'll never have a husband. God's just trying to hold out on you, right? I mean, you, you, you got a husband and you've got a wife and, and man, you won't, you, God says to be faithful to that husband and that wife uh, for the rest of your life. Enjoy the wife of your youth all over scripture. But guess what? I mean, man, God wants you to just have one woman. He's holding out on you. He, he's holding, literally, he's holding out on you. God says to tithe. We've talked about this, but God wants you to tithe. Oh, he wants you to give you money. Why? Because he doesn't want you to have all this stuff. I mean, if you give, if you tithe, you can't buy all this stuff. So he's, he's holding out on you. He, he's holding out. Listen, that's what God does. He, he tries to, to lie to you and he accuses God. He can't accuse you to God any longer. So he doesn't even try. He knows it's futile. Jesus done stumped him out of heaven, right? He can't go, but he accuses God to you. And, it, and many people buy into it and they think, oh, I deserve it. Oh, I can do this because God is holding out. He accuses God to you. But listen, here's one of the most devastating things. He accuses you to you. Man, he accuses you to you and it's devastating. He, he comes to you. He can't go to God and accuse you because God said, no, he's mine. She's mine. She's righteous. She's a child of God. She is mine. I bought her with my price. She's precious in my sight. Uh, I, but so he, he, he can't do that. So he goes to you and he comes to you and he accuses you to you. Can you believe you did that? You think you can, you think God really loves you? Look at what you did. Look at what you've done in your life. You, you literally, I mean, man, you, you look at porn. God can't use that. People's gonna laugh at you. you. You think you can share the gospel with somebody? People's gonna laugh at you. Look at you and all you do. You're not perfect. You can't share the gospel. Your marriage, look, look, look at your marriage. Look at what you've done. Man, you, you, you've been unfaithful to your wife. Your marriage has no future. Nobody likes you. Nobody thinks you're good enough. Everybody looking at you and they're wondering, yeah, what's, what's he saying? Why is he, you ever felt that way? It's because he's accusing you to you because he can't accuse you to God. So he gets you to believe his lies about you. And the thing, bad thing is, is people believe uh, his lies and what it does is, listen, he knows he can't have you. He knows he can't take your salvation. He knows he can't take your standing before God. So he wants to take you out of the game. He wants to confuse you. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to ruin your effectiveness. That's what he wants to do. So he accuses you to you. You're no good. You have no future. You, God can't use you. Man, Martin Luther had this incredible saying. It's got a Martin Luther. He had this incredible saying in Latin. And his incredible saying in Latin was simul ustus et peccator. Now, I know you don't, the Latin's, it, it really, who cares about what it means? But here's what it means. Simul ustus et peccator. Simul, simultaneously sinner and justified. Simultaneously sinner and justified. That's all of us. In other words, I, 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 do I commit sins every day of my life? And you do too. Man, we live in a broken world. I'm not perfect, and you're not perfect. And here's what happens. When you commit that sin, then uh, the enemy comes. Oh, he, he sees an opportunity. Oh, I got him now. I can hold this over his head. I can bind him up with this. I can have her to carry this baggage around. It will take her out of the game. Man, she won't be in the sidelines. She'll be in the stands hiding, right? Because she committed this sin. That's what he does. Because you do commit sins, but what you've got to realize is I'm simultaneously 
justified. I'm simultaneously right before God, right? Here's what that means. You're simultaneously a sinner. You are more wicked than you can ever imagine, folks. You gotta understand that. At the same time, you are more loved than you ever dreamed. You gotta remember that. One of my pastor friends, J.D. Greer, he, he, he says it like this. He says the enemy, and I love this, he says the enemy starts with what you did and just takes that to tear down who you are. But God starts with who you are and then rebuilds what you did. Man, listen, here's what I want you to understand, folks. If you can get this, the next time that you begin to think, I, I'm, I'm, man, I'm not worthy, uh, I, I, I'm no good, I don't have a future, uh, nobody likes me, nobody loves me, nobody, I, I don't have the authority to share the gospel with anyone, look at my life, look at what I did last night, I still struggle with this. The next time you think any of that, then you just remember how much God loves you. You just remember that he loved you enough to send his son to die the death you should have died to redeem you. The next time you wonder, worry with guilt, Here's what you need to understand. Many of you come in here worried with guilt. And if you're a Christian, now if you're not a Christian, man, I, the, the answer is Jesus, all right? But if you're not a Christian, here, here's what you need to understand. The answer is, if you are a Christian, I mean, here's what you need. When you struggle with guilt, you need to remember that when God saved you, the moment that he saved you, some of you that was years ago, some of you that was a weeks ago or days ago, right? But whenever God saved you, he didn't just forgive the sins you had committed. He knew all of your life and every sin you've ever committed. And when he saved you at that moment, he marked every one of those sins paid in full. He forgave the sin I'm gonna commit tomorrow and next year if I'm still alive. That means when I do sin and I allow that sin to weigh me down with guilt, I, I can still confess that sin, not to be right with God, but because I, 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 I want a relationship with my father, right? Uh, so I confess it. But when I let it weigh me down with guilt, that means I'm forgetting that sin is already forgiven. I'm allowing the enemy to, to, to bind me up with his lies about who I am. Listen, when you worry, worry with guilt, then you need to under, remember how far God has cast your sins. As far as the east is from the west, he says. How far is the east from the west? It never stops. He's cast your sins so far away from you, right? I mean, and, and some of you, you, you got that in your mind. Here's the thing with the Christian. If you're a believer, I think you know that. You get that in your mind. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. That's in your mind. You know that. God has forgiven me. But you see, Pat, my problem is I can't forgive myself. That's where I have a hard time. You ever thought that? I can't forgive myself. And then you just need to realize at that point, then your opinion of you matters more than God's opinion of you. Your forgiveness of you matters more than God's forgiveness of you, if that's the case. Listen, you need to understand that there is literally, because you conquered how? In the blood of the lamb. You didn't conquer in your own efforts. You didn't conquer in your own efforts, right? You, you, you didn't conquer in, in, in anything you did. You conquered in the blood of the lamb. What does it mean, the blood of the lamb? Here's what it means. It means that it refers back to, basically, it goes all the way back to the Passover, which began in Exodus. And since the Passover, uh, they, the people of God in the Old Testament, they slaughtered these lambs and they sacrificed animals, right? Why? Because God said in Leviticus that the price for sin was death. Life is in the blood. We sang about the blood today. Uh, the blood is still the blood. The blood is still important because life is in the blood. Blood represents life and it represents Jesus. Jesus' blood represents Jesus' life given as a price for your sin. So all those animal sacrifice, they were a, a foreshadow, a symbol of Jesus, right? And here's what would happen. Every year uh, on the day of atonement, the, 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 the father, the head of the home would bring a spotless lamb to the temple and they would lay it on the altar and he would begin to confess the sins of the family over the lamb. And when he was confessing the sins of the family over the lamb, the priest would then take a, a knife and slit the throat of the lamb. You're like, oh, that's bloody. That's what, yes, it is. That, that, that's, that's, what, that's what our sin is. He would slit the throat of the lamb and the lamb would die in place of the family for the sins of the family. And that's why Jesus is called the Lamb of God. He was slaughtered for you, 
for all those who believe. You conquer by him, by what he did, not by what you do, by the blood of the lamb. And so therefore there is now no condemnation that before those who are in Christ, there is no accusation against you that can stand. And so Christian, listen, when you get feeling guilty, when you feel like, man, uh, no, I'm not good enough, uh, God can't use me, it's a lie. It smells like smoke because it's from the pit of hell. It is a lie from the enemy who is trying to confuse you and take you out of the game and steal your joy because that's not how God sees you. It is forgiven already. You are forgiven, you're redeemed, you're righteous. That's how God sees you. Don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie. You're overcome by the, by the blood of the lamb. And second, you over, the, the, the Christians overcome by the power of their testimony. Now, now we, you've heard the word testimony. When we hear somebody talk about testimony, they talk about what God's done in their life, right? And that's what it means. Testimony is personal story. Uh, somebody tells, this is what God's done in my life. If, if you're a, a drug addict, you know, uh, you, you tell your story, man, this is who I was, this is what God did, and the, the, the attempt there, the purpose is not to get people to go, you were a drug addict, now you're not, you are so good, man, you're so, you're, you're so, you've got so much strength. No, it's to get them to go, man, your God is so good. You know, if you, if, if whatever your life is, your testimony is what God has done to point to the goodness of God. In this passage, the word testimony doesn't mean personal story. It means the story of Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. In other words, it means sharing the gospel. That's what, that's what this means. That's what the word testimony, how did they conquer? By the blood of the lamb, by Jesus' death. He's been conquered. Don't let him lie to you. He's been conquered. But also by the sharing of the gospel. How did they conquer? By the sharing of the gospel. Why does the sharing of the gospel, why is that conquering? Because listen, folks, uh, when the devil was defeated, he wants it kept down. He doesn't want the news of his defeat to spread. He wants it kept down. Because when you share the gospel and people believe it and they're redeemed, then guess what? He loses power. His power is diminished. You're pushing back darkness. You're advancing the kingdom of God. So he doesn't want you to do that. That's why he tells you those lies. Oh, you can't. You don't know enough scripture. Oh, look at what you did. They'll laugh at you. You can't tell them about Jesus. Your life's a wreck. Right, he lies to you. And, and so, how's he conquered? When you share the gospel, we call it live sent, right? You live sent because the church is a sending church, Acts 13, Romans. We send people to share the gospel, right? And so, so when, when you go share the gospel, you push back the darkness in the world. You diminish his, his, his power, the power of the enemy. And that's what we need. That's what the church is literally full of. Listen, the church is full of missionaries. Now, we want more members. Membership in a local church is biblical, folks. I know that's another false teaching that's out there today. Oh, I done membership. Membership is biblical. And I can make multiple reasons for that. That's not this sermon, but it's biblical. We want you to be members because we want you to be in community. We want you to, to have accountability. We want you to have care. We, we want you to, you know, uh, have pastoral authority. And if you're not a member, I don't have, who, who has authority in your life? All those things. Membership is, is, is vital. It's biblical. But listen, and if you haven't yet, jump into first steps. First step, it tells you how to become a member, all right? Membership is important, but let me tell you what we need more than members is we need for every member to understand that they're missionaries, okay? Every member, every Christian should be a missionary. Missionaries are not just for people who sell out everything and not, not for superstar Christians who sell out everything and move overseas. That's not just what a missionary is. Yeah, some people do that. Missionaries are not just for people who wear shirts, you know, with pockets here and pockets here and they got a slide projector and show you slides and tell stories. You know, that's not what a missionary, I mean, yes, that, some people, some missionaries do that stuff. That's not what missionaries limited to. Let me tell you who's a missionary. If you're saved, you're a missionary. And let me tell you something. God doesn't see a missionary in Africa right now any more important than he sees you. You're a missionary if you go to Africa to share the gospel, and you're a missionary if you go to Nissan to share the gospel. <laughs> you know, the difference is the guy in Africa had to raise his money, sweat and toil, beg and plead for his money. Nissan's paying your salary to be a missionary. Right? You go to teach tomorrow, you're a missionary. You go home with a homemaker with your kids, you're a missionary. You, 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 go, you go to your office, you're a missionary. You're a missionary, folks. That's what it means to live sent. 
in every domain of life. He was conquered by the blood of the lamb and by the power of their testimony. Now, folks, it's important that you get this. Why? Because our world is broken. That's not news to you, is it? I mean, man, just go home and watch five seconds of the news or read one story in the newspaper. Our world is broken. It's full of civil unrest and social unrest. It's full of division. I mean, it's more divided on every term. From I mean, it's it's, it's broken, and our world is broken. And, 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 And let me make sure you understand something. Here's what our world needs to understand. Our world needs to understand that it's broken, and our message to the world is not, hey, world, you're broken, you fix you, because you can't fix you. The world can't fix, you can never fix yourself. But guess what else our message is not? Our message is not, hey, world, you're broken, come to church, we can fix you. That's not our message. Man, I, can, I, I can't fix you. You can't fix anybody. We can't fix you. You can't fix you. The only one that can fix you is Jesus. That's it. I know that it sounds simple, but let me make sure you understand this. I know this just sounds, oh, Pat, it's, it's oversimplified. But let me make sure. Our world is in a mess of division right now because of the lies of the devil and the battle against the woman. And, and, and he's confusing us with low-hanging fruit. And he's confusing us with racism. He's confusing us with division. He's confusing us with God and country, nationalism. He's confusing us with all this stuff. And let me make sure you understand something, right? I, I, I want you to understand that racism is real in our world. And I say this over and over because we've got to get it as a church, and in the world, we spend billions of dollars. I don't know if you understand how many billions of dollars we have spent in our world trying to figure out racism, and it's every last penny is a waste. We wasted billions of dollars trying to figure it out because the answer is not in any of those, any of those, uh, the solution is not in any of those answers that we come up with, right? Because the world can't fix the world. Science is awesome, uh, uh, knowledge is awesome, I'm a, I love it all, but listen, here's the answer. What's the problem and what's the answer? The, the problem is sin and the answer is Jesus reigning in the hearts of his people. That's the answer for racism. It's Jesus reigning in the hearts of his people. Racism will never be eradicated in the world because people are selfish, wicked, and unto themselves. It'll never be eradicated out there. But in the church, it should be. It should not look in the church like it looks in the world. And when it does, something's wrong. It should be eradicated in the hearts of those who Jesus reigned. That's the answer, is Jesus reigning in the hearts of his people. You know what the answer is to your broken marriage? Man, some of you need counseling. I mean, we do grace marriage. We've got counseling. If you need it, please call us. Man, we've got, I continually hear nothing but rave about our counseling ministry but let me make sure you understand something. what's gonna fix your marriage. What's gonna fix your marriage is not just having more patience. Why? It's the reign of Jesus in your heart then that produces a fruit of the spirit of patience, right? I mean, it's the reign of Jesus in the heart of a husband and a wife. That's what's gonna fix your marriage. What's gonna fix your kids? I mean, man, beating them? No, I'm not against a good spanking every now and then. <laughs> That's not, what's gonna fix your kids? I mean, trying to talk sense into them? (laughs) We all know that's futile. I mean, listen, what's gonna fix our kids? The reign of Jesus in their heart. Man, that's, that's, that's the problem. John lets us, pulls back the, the curtains, lets us know what's wrong with the world. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 lets us know what's wrong with the world. It's this slimy serpent, the devil, that slithers in and tells you lies and gets you to believe that God's not good. And the answer is Jesus reigning in your heart. Because when Jesus reigns in your heart, then, then I do see color. I do see that Rico is a black man. And I'm a white man. I see that. And it's to be seen and celebrated. I don't see it because I want to separate. It's to be seen and celebrated, right? I I do see that. But listen, when Jesus reigns in our heart, when Jesus doesn't reign in our heart, I look at any difference I can find to say, you're not as good as me, right? When Jesus reigns in my heart, I look at my wife and, and I look at all of her flaws and she's got many folks and I overlook them. Because love covers a multitude of sins, right? When Jesus reigns in my heart, I treat her differently, right? When Jesus reigns in my heart, everything's different. That's the answer. That's the answer, folks. How are they gonna know? 
Well, they're not, not if someone doesn't preach. Well, how are they gonna preach unless someone sends them? Right? Well, that's, that's what Paul says in Romans. That's why we say live sin. You gotta share the gospel. That's your pushing back darkness. Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you you can't. You're not smart enough. You don't know enough verses. You're not good enough. Nobody's gonna have moral authority. Nobody's gonna listen to you because of what you've done. You don't have moral authority. Don't listen to that lying serpent. Said that as nice as I could. Don't listen. So we preach the gospel. And listen, we're into the social gospel. Here's what I want you to understand. Man, in our world, let me tell you something that's a false, uh, uh, one of the false teachings, the lies of the enemy. Well, just do the social gospel. You see, that's big in, in, in millennial generation. And younger. Well, we need to be more focused on the social gospel. You know, the social gospel means social needs, man. We need to put shoes on people's feet that don't have shoes. We need to feed the hungry. We need to, you know, try to house the homeless. We need to, uh, and, and folks, listen, we do every bit of that, I want you to know. We take care of the homeless in multiple ways. We have what's called room in the, room in the inn from November to like April where we bring over Friday night, we bring homeless men into our church. We feed them. Man, we, we give them clothes if they need clothes. We cut their hair if they, if they need haircuts. We, we, we give them a place to take a shower. We give them a place to sleep out of the cold weather. We do that. We work with the Journey Home down in Murfreesboro. That's a homeless shelter. For, we, we work with the Journey Home. Man, we work with refugees who are coming into our country that doesn't know how to bank, they don't know how to buy gas. They don't know how to buy groceries. We work with them and help them to understand it. We work with uh, weary housing, community servants, with the refugees who live there. Man, we work with orphans. We, we do social ministry, okay? And so, but, but with big with the millennial generation is just do social ministry. I mean, man, we just gotta serve, and we do, but we, that's not where it ends. I heard someone one time, someone, Francis of a sissy is uh, quoted with saying this, and I don't believe he ever said it, but someone said, preach the gospel at all times if necessary. Huge words. You ever heard that? I think it's the dumbest statement I've ever heard. I'm just going to be honest with you. Preach the gospel at all times if necessary. Use words. That's like saying, man, give me your phone number at all times. If necessary, use digits, right? I mean, you can't preach the gospel without words because here's what happens. And I see it all the time, man. I, I love the generation. I love the people. And it's not a generational thing. Please don't think I'm harping on a generation. But I love the people who get on Facebook when a hurricane happens. And man, I donated. I put, give my $10 to the Red Cross like they did something. And all that did was pat myself on the back. And you can see what I'm doing. I did my part. I, I was in. Listen, folks, giving you $10 is great. I'm not saying don't give $10. That, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, here's the issue. If you simply put food in someone's stomach and their stomach's full but their heart's empty, you failed. That's not gonna help them. And man, if I can help someone temporarily be warm right now, which I should do, but if I only help them be warm right now and for in, 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 in time for a moment and they suffer in hell for eternity, what have I done? Man, I've neglected. Let me tell you what I've done. I've made myself feel good for helping them. That's what I've done. I've made myself feel good. And, 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 and people look at me and go, oh, you're a good person, Pat, rather than, oh, God is a good God. But when they give their heart to Jesus and Jesus reigns in their heart, at that point, then people will be going, God is a good God. So we, we use the social gospel. We wanna take care of the needs. Why? Because Jesus did. He healed people, man. He fed people. Man, man, he fed 5,000 men and, and with women and children, probably 20,000 with a happy meal, Right? I mean, I mean, he, he met people's needs, but he did it. What did he do? He met all their needs, and then people were following him. They were following him for the free insurance because he was healing everybody and the free food because he was giving them food. But then what did he say? He, he told them the gospel, and they all, most of them walked away. He did it to share the gospel. We need to share the gospel because we push back darkness, and that's the answer. You diminish the enemy's power in the fight when you share the gospel. Are you living sin? Are you living sin? Are you living sin? So, so we, we, we conquer. We conquer by the blood of the lamb. We conquer by the power of the testimony. And then finally, Christians conquer by loving God more than their life. That's what he said. They love not their life even unto death. They conquered in verse 11 because they love not their life even unto death. What does that mean? It means they love their life more than God. They love God more than their life. They love God. I, can't, I don't get that back mixed up. They love God more than their life. Listen, all through history, all through history, it, I mean, there's been people that have been persecuted. John wrote this, remember, to the churches in Asia Minor 
present day Turkey. Why? Because they were being persecuted like crazy. They were being ran out of town. They were being denied food. They couldn't work. If they didn't worship the emperor, they took away their union card, their guild card. They were being murdered and killed. Listen, they were being persecuted uh, horrendously. And he wrote this to let them know Jesus is one, right? History's full of people uh, who've been martyred for their faith. Full of people. Fox's Book of Martyrs, it's F-O-X-X. I, 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 I would encourage you to get this book. It is a book that recounts some of the stories of people who've been martyred for their faith through history. I, I encourage you to read it because it will remind you that it cost you something. I encourage you to read it to your kids because your kids need to know that following Jesus is not just saying a prayer and getting cookie and Kool-Aid at Bible school. It is life and it means I'm laying everything on the line for him. I encourage you to get it and to read it, right? Because it lets us know that, 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 that the cost of following Jesus. And when John says they love their life, that, that they love not their lives even unto death, it's a value statement. What's he saying? He's saying they love Jesus more than sports. They love Jesus more than their possessions. They love Jesus more than their kids. They love Jesus more than their than their. Uh, husband or wife. They love Jesus more than their jobs. They love Jesus more than their dreams, their dream house. They love Jesus more than anything. That's what he's saying. They love Jesus more than their prosperity, more than their health, more than their wealth. They were willing to give up the good things for the greatest thing. He's saying that they were willing to sacrifice all things in life, including life itself, because this life is not the most valuable thing. They'd rather die than yield one inch of their life to the enemy. They refuse to let anything get a grip on their heart in a way that would diminish their passion for Jesus. Because l- l- listen, here- here's what you need to understand. If the, enemy, if the enemy gets you to love anything, anything more than Jesus, he wins the battle. But if he cannot get you to love anything more than Jesus, if, you're, if you love Jesus more than anything, you win the battle. He loses. They love not their life even unto death. They love Jesus more than God. What, what, I mean, I'm sorry. They love God more than life. They love God more than life. Let me get that right. They love God more than life. Do you? And folks, don't just answer that and say, oh, yeah, I love God more than life because I'm just gonna be honest. In my life, it's a daily battle. It's a daily battle for something to come into place, whether it's football. I mean, that's a battle in the fall, right, for me. I mean, that's a battle. I, it's a battle because I love football, man. I, I, love, I, I love my truck. I've got a diesel truck, and I love my diesel truck, but I don't love it more than God. I mean, if I had to, I could get me a little toy boy truck like Peyton Bullen's got, our mission pastor, you know, one of those uh, Tacoma jobs. I could get one of those little, for little people, but I, I got me a diesel truck. I'm kidding. I, I love to ride it. I, get, I, I, I love that truck. But man, I don't love it more than God. I love my kids. But I don't love my kids more than God. Let me tell you what put me into the middle of that was when my oldest son called me one day when he was in Bangkok and said he thought God may be calling him to go to Burma where they kill Christians. And if I love my son, now this is where the metal meets the road. Do I love God more than my son or do I love my son more than God? You see, I could have said, no, son, I, I, that's dangerous. You don't need to go. What I had to do was swallow hard, pray hard, and then say, son, they kill Christians there, but if you feel like God's calling you there, I'll help you get there to share the gospel because that's how people conquer. What do you love more than God? Do you love your marriage? Do you love the thought of being married more than God? You do if you're just breaking God's commands to get a husband or to get a wife. And you see, love is not, love is. Jesus said, this is how I know if you love me, if you obey my commands. So it is obedience, but you know what? It's also affection because he says, if, if you love your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your children more than me, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And so, you know, how, how do you love your mom and dad? With affection. And so it, it's, it's, it's not less than affection. And so how do you love God more? Well, you, if you're not in the word, you're not gonna love him more because that's his, that's his words to you. You're not listening to him. If you're not praying, if you're not meeting with worshiping, I mean, these are ways you love God more. Do you love God more than life? That's how you win. And so, so here, here, here's what I would say. Here, here's what we need to understand today. 
We can conquer through Christ. The, the world is at war. There's a cosmic conflict. There is a battle going on. And if you're a Christian, it's not for your soul. That's taken care of. He can't have you. He can't have your salvation. He can't take your salvation. The battle is for your joy and your effectiveness and your peace here. That's the battle. How do you conquer through the blood of the lamb? If you're not a believer, you need to understand that you will be at war and he has won the war, but you can conquer through the blood of the lamb by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and his lordship. And if you wanna know how to do that, if you'll text the word Jesus to 1-615-551-9800, we will help you today begin to walk through that. You can do that in a room or please come and see us. If you're not a believer, please today, Conquer through the blood of the lamb. If you are a believer, I wanna remind you, you have conquered through the blood of the lamb. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus, if you're a Christian, I wanna remind you that. Why do I need to remind you? Because sometimes the enemy confuses us in this battle and you need to understand that he cannot accuse you before God because there's no condemnation. Whatever sin you came into this room hanging on to, let it go because there's no condemnation. It is forgiven if you're a believer. It is cast as far as the east is from the west. It is buried in the deepest ocean. It's gone. He cannot bring it up to accuse you. God has removed the penalty of that. Let the baggage go. Walk out with joy. No matter what your past is, your future, God has a hope and a future for you. Understand that, believer. Let that cause you to walk out lighter because you conquered through the blood of the lamb, right? Are you sharing your faith? We conquer through the, through, through the testimony. Are you living sin? Oh, some of you not because the devil's told you you can't. You don't know enough. I don't know enough scripture. Uh, you don't know enough scripture. You, you, you don't have the, you, you look at what you do. Don't believe it. Are you living sin, pushing back darkness? And right now, here, here, here's, here, do you love God more than life? I would challenge you this week to think about what do I love more than God? And every day get up and say, God, there's gonna be a battle today. I want you to be my primary, my primary affection to go to you, my primary devotion, everything above my wife, my husband, my kids, my job, my money, everything, everything. Today, today you can conquer through the blood of the lamb, through the testimony, and by loving God more than life itself, than anything. Now, listen to what they did here. Verse, I'm gonna close Timmy Tape, the band is coming out, because here's what happened. In verse 12, I believe it is. Let me look it up. In verse 12, here's what they said. When he told them that they had conquered by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death, when he told them that they had conquered, what did he say then? He said, therefore, rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice, he said. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Rejoice, Christian, why? Because Jesus has redeemed you, because you, the, the enemy can no longer accuse you to God. Don't let him accuse you to you. Don't let him accuse God to you. Rejoice because you're redeemed. Rejoice because when you share the gospel, even if people don't receive it, you're pushing back darkness. Rejoice when you love God more than life. Rejoice, but he says, woe to you who dwell on earth. And that, that, that's a technical for, for, term for those who do not know Christ. Woe to you. And I say, today, it's woe to you if you don't know Christ, but it doesn't have to be after today because today you can give your life to Jesus Christ and you can conquer. But for those of you who do, he says rejoice. Knowing all these things should cause you to rejoice. The battle's won. Salvation is secure. The enemy is defeated. Jesus is reigning right now. Rejoice. I'm gonna pray and if you're a believer, you need to rejoice. And if you are a believer who's carrying guilt, you need to thank God that, that he has redeemed you from that. You can lay it down and walk away. And you can rejoice. If you're not, not a believer today, God can save your soul and then you can rejoice. Let's pray together and then let's rejoice. God, we love you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, Father. I know we're in a battle and God, uh, anybody with any kind of a mind could see we're at war. There is something going on that we can't fix. And God, it is this cosmic conflict. And I pray that today that Christians who know this would be committed to conquering through the blood of the lamb, through their testimony, through loving God more than life. God, I pray that we would be committed to conquering, Lord, through you. We can't conquer, we can't fix, we can't win. 
We don't have to because you already have, God. Help us to proclaim that and help us to rejoice. I pray for every Christian that come in this room today. God, so many Christians, Christians are weighed down right now because they know you've forgiven them from something they did in their past. Maybe it was an entire lifestyle. Maybe it was something they did 10 years ago, 15 years ago, last year, and they're still weighed down. It's still an anchor that's keeping them back. And I pray that today it would be cut free. They would be set free. They would be able to walk out with a bounce in their step because God, the enemy can no longer accuse them. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And I pray that they would know that and celebrate and rejoice. I pray that they would share the gospel. And when you save, when they do, help them to rejoice. And when you don't, God, we rejoice because they were obedient. God, I pray that they would love you more than life and that we would rejoice because all the things that we can buy or all the things that we can get in life do not compare to you. But when we love you more, God, that's when we're content. That's when we're truly satisfied. That's when things are right. God, then we can rejoice. God, right now, I pray that we would rejoice because we're saved. And I pray that we would rejoice because we see you save other people in Jesus' name. Amen.